Brought to you by FlowSpark Media. In this uh, DMN mode, uh, default mode network, or I call it the daydream mode, all these uh, aha moments appear, and all these random thoughts that suddenly can become a novel, a movie, a, a piece of art, music, whatever you want to make, really. Welcome to another episode of the Science Centric Podcast. If you're new to this show, it's where we have thought-provoking conversations about science, society, and the natural world. And who am I? I am your host, Eric Olson, filmmaker, journalist, and all-around curious creative with a passion for science and nature. So it's a new year, and I thought it would be a great time for an episode that would help us kick off the year on a positive and productive note. So I invited journalist and author Hilda Estby to discuss her latest book, The Key to Creativity, the science behind ideas, and how daydreaming can change the world. After all, if we're going to solve some of the pressing problems facing humanity, we're going to have to get creative. In my wide-ranging conversation with Hilda, we discussed the different types of creativity, the brain states that produce creative thoughts, and those most likely to block them, the activities most likely to put you in a creative mindset, and why certain groups have extra challenges when it comes to reaching peak creativity. All that and more is coming up, so tune in, turn on, and prepare to learn how you can wring the most creativity out of the billions of neurons parked right between your ears. But before we jump into this episode, just a quick reminder to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell there for notifications when new content goes live. Thanks for helping this channel to grow and for making the world a little more science-centric. My first question about your book um, and about the subject of creativity is a big one, which is what is creativity? And in addition to that, is there more than one type of creativity? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I have to say that creativity is the human set uh, of mind. <laughs> it is being human. <laughs> and I can specify, it means that our brains are constantly working out stories about uh, who we are and what we do in the universe. So uh, no matter what we experience, we will color this experience with uh, other exper earlier experiences and with our expectations of the future. So we're constantly writing a story about ourselves and what we're doing. And we're constantly trying to understand other people and uh, all the phenomena around us. So, but we can talk about several types of creativity, of course. But the kind of most basic that we do all the time, which is the kind of... <laughs> everyone is doing this, from the mailman to kind of an engineer or... Um, uh, executive in a company, whatever, you are solving problems. <laughs> and solving problems is a very basic way of doing creative work. And we all do it constantly, uh, making dinner or um, writing a novel. So that right. is one of the most basic forms of creativity. And it makes us happy to solve problems. So we humans, we love to solve problems, no matter what they are. And uh, the other kind of, it's several types of creativity, like these kind of aha moments that I uh, wrote a whole chapter on in my book. The aha moments are another type of kind of more um, sudden ideas just pop into your head. And uh, mm -hmm. I've talked to several people that have, have these kind of sudden aha moments one guy that had this uh, very good idea for, he's a dentist, but he had this very good idea, it turned out, for how to construct modern skis. And uh, now modern skis are constru constructed just as he imagined they would be. Uh, and he had this just sudden moment. It was in the middle of the summer even. <laughs> it wasn't even skiing season. So that is another kind of creativity that is kind of more valued than the problem solving type of creativity, mm. because that is also linked to this creative genius <laughs> who suddenly gets this epiphany and right. it changes the world type of, yeah. So I'm, I'm writing about that as well. 
which is uh, b- because this is one of uh, the biggest geniuses in our time. Uh, you know, Einstein, he uh, yeah. he made a problem for himself. So it's part of problem solving. He made a problem for himself. And then after 10 years of just thinking about this problem, he suddenly, out of the blue, he solved it. He gave himself the problem, can I look myself in the mirror if I'm traveling at light speed? Because <laughs> you're dependent on the light to get the picture back from the mirror. Right, right. They yeah. gave himself think, this problem. It's several stories concerning. I think a lot happened. of people, I think a lot of people don't know that story though. They don't know that 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 he had this. He'd given himself this problem. I mean, he's very famous for the e equals mc squared equation, but I don't mm-hmm. think that they knew where it this, came from. This, this problem that he was trying to sort out, and it's also a story with um, a tram in the. Uh, in Vienna, I think he he gave himself this problem in se- several ways. But after ten years of just uh, meandering around it, he suddenly, out of the blue, ten years after he was twenty five, now he talked to his friend Michele Basso, and then he said, suddenly in the middle of the sentence, he said, "Now I know the solution," and he wrote the uh, relativity theory from there. That's that same afternoon. Yeah. It's um I've also heard that or read somewhere that he that he almost felt it in his body or something. That mm. he knew this was right. That, yeah. And that is yeah. typical for aha moments that you feel mm-hmm. that they are right. There's a good feeling going through your body. It's um sudden increase in perception, <laughs> which sounds very technical, but it means it's just like um, you know, when you play Tetris, uh, you get this moment where all are lined up. So everything is lined up suddenly and you can see everything clearly. So I use this example of a guy realizing that his wife is cheating on him. And that feels good. <laughs> it shouldn't, but it feels good because suddenly everything makes sense. That before uh... this was unclear and uh, didn't make sense, right? There's mm-hmm. a sudden moment of clearness, an increase in perception. It feels very true. And that is what is very misleading about these aha moments, because that goes for conspiracy theories as well. They feel, <laughs> they feel very true. right? Yes, and it's yeah. an increase in perception and everything. It's like, okay, all the world's leaders are lizards. Yeah, <laughs> it all makes sense now. <laughs> There's <laughs> an increase in perception, and it feels very true. And yeah. the, um, the last thing about the aha moments, they're true, it's increase in perception, and you feel happy when you get them. They're very memorable also. So most often you will remember exactly when you had this kind of aha moment, where you were, were at the time. Yeah. Hey there, if you made it this far through the episode, you're probably enjoying this conversation and learning a few new things along the way. If so, I'd really appreciate your support so that we can bring you even more quality science and nature content to YouTube. Head on over to our Patreon page to find out how you can support us directly. We have three tiers you can join and they start at only a dollar a month. The link's in the description below. And thank you to our existing patrons for their support. Now on with the show. So you mentioned problem solving. You mentioned these sort of flashes of insight of, of, you know, where everything makes sense all of a sudden. Mm. Um, but there's also, you know, artistic creativity, imagination. Mm. And how does that, how does that relate to the, to the other two? Yeah, well, um, it's, They are both part of it, or problem solving. I mean, when I write a book, it's kind of a series of problems I have to solve throughout the book. And the imagination, that is uh, where I had to uh, get some electricity through my brain (laughs) to get into (laughs) into the part of my brain where uh, the imagination is living freely. And... uh, that is uh, in the scientists, brain scientists call this uh, part of the brain for, or the system in the brain for 
DMN, Default Mode uh-huh. Network. And uh, this was discovered by a researcher called uh, Marcus Rachel. He was uh, investigating the frontal lobe. He was trying to find out more about the executive function in the brain, which is what, what we're in right now. We're in the executive function where we're concentrated uh, on something outside uh, ourselves. We're trying mm-hmm. to solve problems together. We're talking. We have to have a direction to this talk, etc. So we're engaging our executive function. And when we're in the executive function, we're very eager to block out everything that is irrelevant to our talk right now, right? Or to whatever kind of problem solving we are doing. We're trying to block out uh, all all kind of irrelevant sounds and visions and also all irrelevant ideas and kind of associative uh, thoughts kind of wild associate uh, association. association so yeah uh, marcus rachel was just trying to find out how the executive function is working and where it is and he was scanning people while they were solving problems he gave them and then he said uh, to the people he was scanning that they uh, should just think about nothing so that he could see what the kind of baseline of the brain would be when we're just not thinking about anything and to his surprise he could then see that uh, these people were jumping from high activity in this frontal area frontal um, lobe and the temporal lobe and then there were a high level of activity just a little more back in the brain and he called this default mode network um because he could see that the brain was jumping back into this uh, brain system uh, the minute uh, the brain wasn't solving problems in the outside world. And he asked people, what, what were you thinking about? I, I told you to think about nothing. And people said, yeah, I was thinking about nothing. I was thinking about my cat, uh, the holiday next year, my, my previous holiday, that uncomfortable talk with my boss. I forgot to pay a bill etc cetera, etc cetera. all these random thoughts that just uh, flush through our brain when we're not doing anything we're, while we're waiting on the bus not doing anything specific not picking up our phone right <laughs> just staring into space my my daughter does it a lot just sit there yeah. and stare into space <laughs> um i think we call it uh in the us and i don't know if it translates but uh zoning out like you're just out. zoning out, yeah. Yeah, we we know uh, know that is extremely important to the brain. It has to do with mental health, and it has to be, do with this wonderful imagination and uh, all of our human creativity. We can harvest a lot from being zoned out. In Norwegian, we have a, a much more kind of negative way of talking about it, so we call it the cow stare. <laughs> So that. that's very negative in Norway to just sit there and be inactive. So we should always be doing something. Otherwise, you're right. like a cow, right? <laughs> or a goat. It's also called a goat stare. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> uh, but the, the, these 15, 20 years with research on this specific system in the brain has shown how impo- important it is to the human imagination, it's important for us to also to consolidate memories in the long-term memory, because that has been a mystery. How do we move experiences over into the long-term memory? So things are flashing through our brain all the time. We're experiencing things uh, all the time, but how does it kind of stick <laughs> how right, does it stick right. and that happens when we are just going around in our own thoughts zoning out and we know know about memory i've also written a book about memory with my sister who's a expert yeah, in yeah. memory and that's why i know a lot about the memory we also know now that memory is the raw material for our visions of the future and visions for the future is also kind of a creative material it's like um, I used to say the first genre humankind uh, ever made was uh, science fiction. <laughs> uh, uh, that means we use what we know 
about the future to construct all these visions of right. uh, no, the of the past or to uh, construct these ah. uh, visions of the future. And that right. is what you do in science fiction, right? You know something about the past and you <laughs> cast it into the future. You exaggerate and, you know. Also, right. to have these visions is an antidepressant in itself. So when you're very depressed, you have a very vague memory and you also have very vague visions of the future. So it's kind of our natural antidepressant to have these visions, hope for the future. And yeah. in this uh, DMN mode, uh, default mode network, or I call it the daydream mode because we daydream yeah. here, all these uh, aha moments appear and all these random thoughts that suddenly can become a novel, uh, a movie, a, a piece of art, music, whatever, whatever you want to make, really. Yeah. And also, this is where you find your place in the world as a human. We are always uh, relating to other humans. So in this system, we, we think about who am I compared to others? Who am I in my tribe? Mm. And uh, that is such a big part of being a writer for me is to know my inner voice, to know my drive, to know where my gaze should fall so that I can write about that specific thing. All my books are initiated by me. I, I need to know that this idea is true to me, that I can mm. live with this idea for two or three years, which is the normal <laughs> length of a writing process for me. So you have to have this kind of knowledge of your own inner voice and interest your own passion, what you like and don't like. And when we are always engaged in the outside world, we lose this sense of direction mm -hmm. and we lose this feeling of ourselves and our own inner voice. And that's why I'm so concerned about cell phones because <laughs> uh, when you're yeah. constantly engaged here and you're clicking from thing to thing on TikTok, you don't get this good kind of loan time, this high quality loan time where you just figure out who you self, who you are yeah. yourself yeah. and find these ideas and kind of can, can try to construct your own stories about the world. Uh, so a lot to unpack there. Let's, let's start with, let's start with the DMN, uh, this default mode network. So it's it's not one particular part of the brain. It's actually it's a it's system. Maybe multiple parts of the brain that are all interacting together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, one thing that, um, uh, yeah. and of course, I'm making kind of this. Uh, it's uh, I'm making a dichotomy now between the executive function and the DMN mode, but uh, research shows then that when uh, when we are making art, when we're experienced artists, this is a this is a study made on jazz musicians. When we're experienced artists, we have the ability to do both at the same time. We have to have direction, right, and concentration when uh, yeah. we're executing art. But we also have this ability to wander, meander in our in, mm. in our mind at the same time. So experienced jazz musicians. Uh, uh, compared to amateur jazz musicians, the experienced ones could be in both system at the same time, kind of doing both things at the same time. Whereas when you're an amateur, you are very kind of in the executive function because you just need to play the right notes, right? So yeah. that's what's happening when I'm writing too, that I can feel that. That is how flow is. Yeah, I was going to say flow, flow state. That is the flow oh. state, and it's magical, you know. I feel like I have a direction for what, what I'm writing, but at the same time, I can just, uh, you know, jazz. I can do some kind of impro on, on my way to, to mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. goal. It's just like walking through the woods when you're not in a hurry, when you're not stressed. You're walking through the woods, and you can just wander off the path a little bit, and just sniff some uh, raspberries or look at the bird. Then you go back to the path. And, and maybe in the ways you change your mind of where to go out of the woods, so you go another way than first plant, right? But you get out of the wood, and that is how it feels 
like for me to write a book mm. i have a kind of some idea of where to go but it's not written in stone i can also change direction i can play other kind of i can use other material and this is of course making me very happy it's related to happiness yeah. so there are studies showing that this the kind of how the system in the brain is interacting has to do with depression and happiness. Uh, that yeah. means if they're not interacting a lot, that has to do with, with depression. But this is all kind of new science and it's just not investigated that much. So this is yeah. just a sketch of how it know, might be in the brain. Mm, but I know that, that music in particular is kind of this magical activity that people who have had like brain injuries and things, playing music is actually a form of therapy because it lights up multiple parts of your brain at the same time. So that doesn't surprise me in a way that playing music, you're, you're using both this DMN and executive function at the same time. Yeah, I think all artists are you, you doing exactly that, but music is especially complicated. It yeah. kind of engages the whole brain, really. It's both rhythm, yeah. the melody, it's very advanced, right? So yeah. um, music must be one of the most uh, advanced thing, yeah. things that humans can do. Um, but so, uh, but I, I think all artists have this experience of flow where you kind of, you're both, you, you both have a direction and a, a goal with what you're doing, but you're still able to kind of pick up things on the way. And, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and that is something related to a lot of happiness <laughs> it makes me so happy to do that when you get into yeah. this flow feeling you're just like oh it isn't anything better mm. yeah and i i can i can actually relate to this because i do i am i do play music as well um improvisational i don't know if i would call myself a jazz musician but more in the kind of bluesy uh but it's improvisational and i know exactly what you're talking mm. about um, and it's very relaxing and it just creates great emotions. If I'm in a bad mood, I just pick up my guitar and I, you know, play something and it just, you know, it's, you feel it's, better it's, after, right? I feel better. I feel more relaxed. I feel better. So um, yeah. that makes sense. So um, both music and literature are used in several kinds of therapy. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, with elderly people to use music when they are starting to get uh, dementia. That is bringing them back, keeping them more at present, because the music it is such a memory machine. It really grabs onto all of our memories, and suddenly you can remember a whole uh, song, right? Like like now around Christmas, I don't have <laughs> to look at the lyrics or the melodies. I I know them by heart. They go straight yeah. into my earliest memories. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, coming back to the idea of this default mode network. So uh, another practice that I'm involved in is meditation. Yeah. Um, I try to do, you know, 15 minutes every morning. Do you think that meditation is a route into that default mode network? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think so. And it, it has been investigated. I've been most mostly interested in yoga in that respect since i'm a yogi myself so okay. right, yogi, yoga is kind of moving meditation i use uh, yoga as part of my writing uh, that in that respect that without doing yoga i cannot write <laughs> uh, when i do yoga i or you do meditation uh, you calm your whole body system down in medical research they call uh, they talk about uh, several kind of states mm -hmm. in the body the one being parasympathetic <laughs> para para and i think we would say parasympathetic and parasympathetic. sympathetic and parasympathetic yeah yeah sympathetic network and parasympathetic network and those are kind of opposite in the way that um when you're very, very stressed, you're in the sympathetic network and you're not a sympathetic person. <laughs> yeah, you're more trying to get out of a difficult situation fast. And much in our culture is based on this, that we 
are stressed. <laughs> it's also kind of it's a high status thing to be. It's a good thing if you're stressed, mm. then you're an important person. So we like to value being stressed. Uh, and the sympathetic mode is much being in a stressed mode. You can, of course, be creative then as well when you try to get out of, of a difficult situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I worked as a journalist for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so stressed and I was also very creative trying to get out of this stressed, stressful situations all the time. I had a deadline continuously, right? Um, but uh, what is, is that you're not thinking totally outside the box. You're creative, but you're trapped in this box and you're trying to get out of this difficult mm. situation fast. You're, you're kind of locked to this specific situation. Whereas when you're in the parasympathetic so, yeah, mode, got it. Uh, then you're uh, non-stressed. Uh, to be stressed can also be to be uh, living, th uh, living with a trauma, to live with PTSD or... You know, be uh, it's uh, it's kind of locking a lot of your creativity, really, and you lose your sleep uh, when you're stressed. Mm -hmm. You sleep uh, have less sleep quality, and sleep is one of the fundamental things for the brain to work uh, in a good way. So the parasympathetic way of being is to be relaxed, to be uh, uh, free to explore. <laughs> To it's the um, nerve system of friendship, sex, love, storytelling, music, laughter. When we laugh, we put ourselves into the parasympathetic mode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a way of us, the, our body ourselves is putting ourselves into the parasympathetic mode. On the other hand, if you're very stressed, you don't laugh at that joke, right? When I'm very stressed, I'm yeah, my daughter right. is yeah. trying to fool, uh, be a, a kind of be funny and jokey. I don't laugh at her jokes, so I have to put myself into this calm state where you are free to daydream, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. easily go into this daydream mode that we talked about, and that is what you do when you do meditation or yoga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you're laying the foundations for all of these good things to happen with you so you can take them in right 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 because being a friend is to have that extra time for chit chat right and uh, and have that extra joke you cannot be very efficient when it comes to human relationships or when it comes to art right when it comes to real art you have to be brave and to be brave you have to be safe and secure mm. In the start, you have to have this. I I always create this. Um, uh, it's like I create a castle around myself when I start with a book, and I don't talk to anyone that is very negative or critical to me at that point. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because then I have to protect myself and my idea. So uh, to be able to kind of explore an idea and be very playful with an idea, I have to be surrounded by good people. I have to be in the parasympathetic mode. So I do a lot of yoga. I surround myself with good people. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I come to this uh, myth of the lonely creative genius, which is in fact bullshit. Mm -hmm. So we, we're talking to young people about this myth and it's so toxic. It's uh, ruining people's lives, believing in this myth. That's it. Uh, research shows that uh, this is a um, study done on musicians. Research shows that we, we believe in talented mus musicians, right? But when they asked mu musical teachers to point out their pupils that would become a professional musician, they always pointed at the most talented children, right? When they came back <laughs> years and years later, they, could, they, they knew the answer, right? They could tell who became professional musicians and it wasn't them ah. it wasn't the talented ones yeah it was the ones that just never gave in that always practiced that laid down all the hard work me myself i was uh i was i i will say i have a good voice and i uh, was a talented uh, singer but i didn't have the drive to do that i always always wanted to write 
that I lay down all that hard work in writing. And and I just quit quit singing at a point when I was 22. And uh, I never got back to that. Yeah. Because I wanted to prioritize uh, writing. Yeah. So drive, drive and work is much more important. Also, the kind of loneliness. I've written a book about loneliness too, you <laughs> see. So I know a lot about loneliness. And it's the most destructive force in our life. Mm. It, it will break you down. It will ruin your body even. It's kind of, yeah. it's the source of so much toxic stress, emotional stress, that uh, you get sick from it. Uh, it, that's why researchers say that it's uh, more dangerous to be lonely than to smoke 15 cigarettes a day. I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. And that is because this uh, stress is so intense that it is the root of a lot of our the the most dangerous illnesses. We got like heart disease, um, cancer, and uh, autoimmune diseases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the lonely <laughs> genius doesn't exist right we have to be connected to others to create something yeah. we have to be uh, taken care of by others to or to me i'm always writing to someone right i have trust in people listening to me mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that is the opposite of being lonely also we believe that or from romanticism and onwards we thought that um, or always, really, that men are more creative than women, which is bullshit also, I have to say. Um, the human species have survived because we are so different. We are so different. It's so many different talents spread out in the human race. So we're not dependent on just two strategies of living, the male and the female. Mm. We're dependent on all these strategies of living, thousands of strategies, like someone that can that know math and someone that can uh, paint and someone that can cook and, you know, all these kind of, all these different life strategies that we got is uh, supposed to kind of fulfill each other right. into this big tribe. A uh, very big and very strong tribe with a lot of kind of problem solving in different areas. So, and it's nothing that says that <laughs> the female brain is different than the male brain in problem solving and getting ideas and stuff. But I have research showing that women are much more self critical, which is natural mm. since it, I mean, just 100 years ago, I wouldn't ever have become a writer. Right. I mean, my great grandmother, she was in a farm. She had nine children. So she didn't have an education. Yeah. So um, it's much more new to be able to be expressing ourselves. Yeah. I, also here in Norway. <laughs> I wonder too if it's a function of, um, well, that dichotomy is a function of a couple of things. One is that uh, I think men on average have more uh, mental illness um so maybe that maybe the kind of eccentric artist types are uh are more typically men the ones that you know cut off their ear and um do yeah. do those crazy things that get attention and then also you know women historically have been burdened more with childcare, which is a very pragmatic activity and didn't have that like you said that freedom to to explore, to explore their creative yes. side. Well, so I think there may be multiple, multiple factors there. Um, it's multiple factors. And I looked into also this kind of, we also think of um, the creative person as a kind of half mad kind of. Yes. Uh, because of Vincent Fagog and uh, several other artists, <laughs> uh, there's no reason to try to become mentally ill to create something. Uh, to be depressed is certainly not the way to creativity. It's the opposite of creativity. So depression is uh, all artists being depressed have also been less productive yeah. in the depress- depressive periods of their lives. The only, uh, and of course, schizophrenia have been very idolized and romanticized, but it's only 2% of all people with that diagnosis that has ever made anything because psychosis is horrible. Mm-hmm. It's just horrible. Yeah. And we need to understand that. And 
the only illness, uh, mental illness that is kind of very heavily related to creative work is uh, bipolar. So it's the f- 40%. No, you're 40 times as likely to be bipolar if you're a poet <laughs> than if you're in the normal population. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, an overweight of that. And uh, in the manic periods, you will be able to create much more, of course. So there are several artists that uh, is suffering from bipolar. But um, the other thing is that in the 19th century, a lot of the male artists were um, visiting brothels. So we have this kind of genius thinker called Nietzsche. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people say, oh, okay, yeah, he died in a, a mental hospital because he was so brilliant that he lost his mind from it. But that wasn't it at all. He just he just had put his penis in uh, <laughs> the wrong, wrong place, really. So, so, so you're... The uh, police in the third stage is... You, yes. you get really mentally so it, uh, ill from that. <laughs> I, saw, I saw where you were going with that. I figured it ended with syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that from that we get this wrong imp- impression that if you're very, very brilliant, you have to... Uh, get mad uh, somehow. Yes, but, uh, right. I can assure you. Uh, just look at the case of Einstein. Yes, <laughs> and we can all rest assured. <laughs> <laughs> we can all be as brilliant as we want. We're, you're not in danger. <laughs> do you enjoy books about science and nature as much as I do? They bring a lot of information together and help you learn about science and the natural world on a much deeper level than you just get from consuming news. Well, we've curated a great list of books over at our website on a page we call The Reading Room. It also features the books of all the authors that we've had on this podcast. Any purchases made through The Reading Room help support our channel with no added cost to you. Check it out at sciencecentric.com or look for a link in the description below. Um, I just, I wanted to connect a couple of dots here that you you brought up um, on the science side. So you mentioned, executive function and you also mentioned ex- executive function versus the the default mode network or dmn you also mentioned the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic could you say that um when you're in a sim- when you when you're in the sympathetic uh m- mode of your nervous system that your executive function is more active and yeah, vice versa, so. would you say parasympathetic, mm. your default mode network is more active? Yeah, it allows for more of a, a, def- a default mode network if you're in a parasympathetic mode. Yeah. Okay. You're relaxed, you're happy, you're open to uh, just, yeah, explore ideas and test out things and stuff. Still, if you're on your phone all the time. Yeah. <laughs> If you go to a meditation class and straight after you're just scrolling away, I think you lost a lot of the beneficial effect. You're un- undoing what you uh, what you did um, with yoga or meditation or mm. music. Yeah, it's a lot of ways to get into this uh, relaxed kind of mode where you're open to think. Uh, it's very good to swim. Or uh, to uh, cycle on a bicycle, or uh, to row, like Mahler did when he got the idea for one of his symphonies. He was rowing a boat. Actually, I was kind of really, I I just uh, got hung up on this thing with water. What is it with water and creativity, Mm. right? People are in the shower and they get all these ideas. Uh, Or uh, Archimedes. Archimedes, yeah. Archimedes, who got this idea when he was in a bathtub uh, and ran through the streets of Syracuse, uh, stark naked, screaming Erika. <laughs> and um, uh, it's so many ideas that have been born uh, next to water. I mean, a warm day, July 1862, uh, Charles Ludwig Dodgson sat in a boat with three children. They didn't have an iPad, so they didn't have anything really to entertain them. 
and the children were screaming, please, please, Uncle Charles, tell us a story. And Charles told them a story. He published it under the name Lewis Carroll. It's called Alice in Wonderland. It's one of the biggest successes in book history, translated to almost every language in the world. And that happened on a boat. And it happened when Charles Ludwig Dutchen didn't want to write a huge bestseller. That wasn't his goal. So I got really obsessed with that. And I found this research from Britain. It's called Blue Health. It's a huge research project called Blue Health. And they um, gave 20,000 people an assignment. And that was to report where they were when they felt happy. So they had... They, I think they did it on their phones so they could, uh, and it was connected to location, mm -hmm. so they could make a kind of a map of happiness. And that map of happiness showed that people were so exceedingly much happier by the seaside <laughs> than anywhere else. <laughs> so it was, they could make a kind of list of what makes us happy, and that is which places makes us happy. Mm -hmm. And that is not the mall. It is the... <laughs> By the ocean, and by the uh, in the woods, and it's in the parks, and by fountains. Yeah. And what they think, what researcher thinks is, uh, they what they are thinking oh. is that when we are by the sea, we are going e more easily into this default mode network. Mm -hmm. So happiness and some the parasympathetic <laughs> network. Happiness and this default network is very much linked and is activated when we're close to nature, especially water. Mm. So meditation is good, but the ocean is even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One thought that I had, and, and maybe this was something you were trying to get across in your book, and that's why I, maybe it's not my thought, maybe it's your thought is the idea that creativity, it comes from you, but it can't exist in a vacuum. Meaning, if I was just a monk sitting in the woods, meditating all day, I probably wouldn't be very creative um, as much as a modern uh, 21st century person who is exposed to all of this culture and all of these things going on. So, my thinking is if you really want to be creative, it's almost like you want to bounce between these two dichotomies of a lot of input for your creativity to work on, but then moments mm. of quiet and solitude or sitting by the ocean or sitting and walking in the forest. Is that, Yeah. would you say that's, that's very good? Uh, I would say that is very much what I'm thinking that we have to have both. It's all about balance, really. Mm -hmm. We also have to be in the sympathetic uh, uh, mode sometimes, mm -hmm. kind of in the network, because uh, we have to finish things <laughs> and we have to have this speed into things. So it's just different parts of the process. At start, we have to protect ourselves from critics. In the end of the process, you have to have critics because you have to really start to massage your work and your text and everything mm -hmm. and you have to have speed in the end and much more executive function in the end than in the start in the start i'm kind of like i described to you uh, i i feel like i'm lost i i don't say no to anything mm -hmm. i'm just exploring i'm just wandering in the uh, in the woods without any plan of getting out of the woods <laughs> kind of um so it's you have to do both. Mm -hmm. You have to, and that sounds very wishy-washy, but yeah. the, the thing is, if you know these things about the brain, how it works, how you can facilitate uh, ideas by being calm and rest and being lost, then if you know that, you will start the creative process there. And then you can finish with being very stressed invite a lot of critics most people do that last bit in the start and then they stop themselves mm. immediately 
So it's better to know these things and kind of try to work with your own brain. Mm -hmm. And we kind of follow the natural course of the process rather than stopping yourself continuously. We are so into the results in our culture. Yeah. We should be stars, all of us. Uh, and then we forget the the joy of playing uh, and the thrill of being lost, right? If we're only kind of focusing on uh, that beautiful product. Yeah. I think, um, and you said you've worked as a journalist, and I think a lot of cons consumption of news in particular tends to act tends to create this critical uh, societal voice that we're supposed to be doing something other than what we're doing. Um, mm. We're not keeping up. We're, you know, this person who was very young, became very successful. We're comparing ourselves to that person, even though that person may be an anomaly. Um, mm. So we, it, it seems like it pulls us out of that, like you're talking about that safe creative mode um, so it almost seems like you need to wall yourself off from that kind of content as well so that you're not yeah. doing, and social media, of course, you know, where you're not yeah. just comparing yourself to Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, whoever else, but, or some fashion model, but you're comparing yourself to someone you knew in high school or <laughs> that has a bigger house than yeah. you or a bigger car, but that doesn't yeah. seem, that doesn't seem like it lends itself to creativity. No. Yeah. Uh, also, it puts it makes you very lonely if you're continuously comparing yourself to others. And what happens when we're lonely? We're just we're just so super stressed. Yeah. It's not a good feeling to be in. Uh, yeah, research shows that just just to keep your phone on the table will rise the cortisol level in your blood. Yeah. Right. Just that it's close to you. Uh, so it just makes us very stressed and unhappy if we're going into social media with a vague feeling of loneliness. You you go out to the internet after with a much stronger feeling of loneliness. When you compare yourself to others, you, it's you against them. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you think of yourself as just a very small part of a very big puzzle, and we're all doing our individual thing, just making the same picture together, it feels much better. I have so many friends that are very successful writers. Mm -hmm. I have to always put this feeling aside mm -hmm. of them being much more successful than me. Instead, we help each other. So my successful <laughs> uh, writer friends uh, and me, we read each other's text and give each other feedback in a nice way, not in a competitive way. And that is so important. It's so important for me as a writer. I would encourage everyone who's into doing creative stuff to have a friend that can help you, that will listen to you, and that you can test ideas with yeah. and just support you emotionally. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's great advice. It's something I realize as I get older that you need people and, um, I think, I think to some degree, you know, we buy into that, that, like you said, it's a myth of this creative genius, mm -hmm. but often when you dig a little deeper into that person's story, you find out they had a lot of great people around them, helping them, bouncing ideas off of each other. And, um, it's, exactly. it's this story that we tell again, you know, it's, it's journalism. Journalism loves those stories of somebody who came from nothing and, and rose from the, you know, from nothing to be the success by themselves, you know? And I, I think mm. that's probably not true. Um, it's not that all true. It's impossible, actually. Yeah. It's thousands of people have contributed to me just sitting here today. The people developing the vaccine for COVID or for, <laughs> you know, for pneumonia or whatever. It, it's, it's thousands of people before me in time and now that all together have been holding me. Uh, you're never alone. Yeah. Even the people going to the South Pole, you know, skiing to the South Pole, are totally dependent on everyone making their stuff, like their gloves and their shoes and their skis, or inventing skis, or you know, it's uh, a thousand of inventions that bring you to that point where it looks like you're alone, but 
you were never alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, this idea of, so there's definitely those, those outside critics um, who, you, who you mentioned beginning of the creative process you want to uh, separate yourself from. But we also have this inner critic, and that's something that meditation in particular is very good at bringing forth. It's you become aware of that voice, and this is the be one of the huge benefits of meditation is you become less a slave to that voice. But it's there, mm. and I think you mentioned in the book that this is actually a natural part of our development is to develop this inner critic. Mm -hmm. So what, what role does the inner critic play in creativity is it is it positive or negative and um i think you uh did an experiment where you were able to shut that off and what was that like uh you mean where i got electricity yeah in my brain? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i went to the university of london to explore more about uh, creativity and uh, there's a huge re kind of environment for researching uh, creativity there and um, this was part of a bigger uh, study uh, done on several hundred students at the university where you get some very weak very weak electricity through the uh, frontal and temporal lobe on the right side and uh, that kind of knocks out your temporal lobe, which is like the most active in blocking out all these uh, irrelevant uh, association ideas and random thoughts when we're in the executive function. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it's clear now that uh, the inner critic is, uh, and, and what, I, what happened when I got this, low grade electricity through my brain it wasn't a it wasn't electroshock <laughs> it wasn't like you know the full treatment it was just very vague but i got kind of giggly and it felt like i'd been drinking a glass of wine so i had a lot of ideas and i immediately wrote them down and they were re when when the effect wore off i could see that they were really silly <laughs> So they weren't good ideas. <laughs> and that is mostly the case when we drink a glass of wine and we have these wonderful ideas. Or what happens also that people are waking up in the middle of the night. It happens in a Jerry Seinfeld episode even. That he wakes up in the middle of the night, <laughs> write down the idea. When he looks at it in the morning, it's just rubbish. <laughs> Can't be used for anything. Uh, so it's kind of you're knocking down the temporal lobe and by that you're knocking down the kind of this very efficient part of the executive function so you're not as efficient anymore so it's like you're it's almost like um adhd ah interesting in a way yeah. so adhd is to have kind of a weaker executive function right and that means that i met a lot of people in the creative field that have this diagnosis, mm. right? So you have access to a lot of ideas. So the problem then is to ex execute them. Yeah. With a weaker executive function, that is uh, much more difficult. Your concentration is uh, more difficult to control. So uh, that was what they did. So to me, it's uh, at, in this experiment, that was what they did. They kind of, it was like they were giving me a glass of wine and I got access to a lot of ideas. Research also shows that uh, you can use a glass of wine to knock down your temporal lobe and get access to more of these idea, ideas from the default mode network. But of course, the faster this works, uh, <laughs> the glass of wine, the faster it works on your brain and you would think that is positive. The faster, then it's more predictive for you developing alcoholism. Oh. And you take the next class, and you take the next class. Uh, and no research can support that uh, any kind of uh, drug or alcohol abuse is good for creativity. Interesting. 
So I looked into that as well, and the research shows that a lot of creative people didn't start off as alcoholics, they ended as alcoholics. Mm. So it wasn't what helped them create their career. It was something that they used to kind of ease their their own demons and uh, their own fears. Like Bukowski, I love Bukowski. He's one of my favorite writers. He was a heavy drinker, but he was also kind of very much abused by his parents. They were very abusive parents. Ah. So he had a lot of did you say <laughs> did you say Charles Buka- Bukowski? That's yeah, who you're Charles, yes, okay, I know his yeah, story. Bukowski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was a very lonely man, and um, alcohol can soothe strong emotional pain, of course, and kind of so- kind of smooth all kind of social anxiety. Right. Uh, in the short term. Yes, so alcohol and drug, I cannot say that that will help you. It's also part of the artist myth, but it helps in a short term. It can help you knock down this uh, overly focused part of the brain that makes you kind of uh, stop your ideas, which is the executive function. That is one part of the inner critic, but the other part is very much related to the research I looked at just now when I finished my I just finished my book on loneliness, and in this book, I examine how important other people are to us. So it starts when we are five and or five or six years old, five, six, seven years old. It starts to become even more important than before. What other people are thinking about mm. us outside our own homes, of course, because our parents are the first parameter to us. But if you are you if you're having very, very supportive, nice parents, still you will be starting to become much more critic of yourself. And uh, you're putting more weight into what your teacher is saying and your classmates are saying about your stuff. Yeah. So we're starting to internalize what other people's uh, people are telling us about us. So this is part of the loneliness research, and that is that. If we're feeling that we're going to be ostracized from our group of people, our flock, our tribe, then we will do as much as we can uh, to fit in. The more, uh, the more we fear this ostracism, ostracism, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the more we fear it, the more we will try to get back into the uh, group. And by that, we try to be as normal as possible. And we try to remove everything Mm. that is important when we're doing some creative work, which is to be quirky and find our own voice. We will try to suppress our own voice as much as possible. So um, that is also a lot of the things we're doing in this DMN network. This default mode network, we're thinking about our place in the world, our place in our group. And we're doing a lot of uh, interpretation of other other people's perception of us uh, to try to avoid being thrown out of the group. As, as children, we are very, very vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, we need others to, to survive at all. Yes, right. And, um, but all of us do. We all do. So there are, from my research, it's very clear that uh, there are children that are more easily bullied at school, bullied by other children. And those are, it's a lot of research now showing uh, the weight of racism on uh, people, how it kind of eats you up from inside. It has a lot of kind of physical, it does a lot to our bodies to feel ostracized. Yeah. Like if you're experiencing racism, if you're living with uh, disabilities, you are much more subject to violence and to bullying. If you're subjected to violence at home, you're more subjected to violence by your classmates. So it's a lot of, this became very clear to me in the, in working with loneliness that there are children that will grow up with a much stronger inner critic than others right. just from this fact yeah just from structural ra- racism and discrimination 
and violence and bullying. Yeah. Right. So that that voice will speak th- uh, speak very loud in your mind, and that is of course you're internalizing to avoid this happening to you ever again. Right. If you're being bullied, yeah. you need to know that it will never happen again. To internalize all these critical comments, and they're very easily accessible to you so that it will stop your creative work. Right. I, w- I was thinking that also with, um, I, I imagine that poverty also has this mm-hmm. effect as well. That of course. That I was going to ask you if creativity was, it's, it's something that's more for affluent people because they don't have to always be thinking about where their next meal is coming from or where they're going to sleep. Or, yes. And you're, a- you're able yes. to disengage that executive function more if you have affluence versus people who are, I think yes, those are. I course. think those are probably connected together. Yes, of course, yeah. it's very true, and of course that is part of uh, the problem with my great grandmother living in a very poor farm, uh, just uh, having a lot of children. <laughs> You're very busy with that. You're also just very worried. You don't have the extra time or extra energy to do anything else than survive. Yeah, but even so, even. Even in poverty, you will always try to find beautiful things. You will always try to solve problems. And my great grandmother did creative work like knitting or embroidery. Mm -hmm. And these have been kind of the poor women's outlet of creativity. And of course, people can rise from poverty and still be able to uh, be creative. Nothing is set in stone. Uh, Charles Dickens grew up with a violent stepfather and he's, uh, he was put in a factory, a shoeshine factory, when he was 12 because they had a bankruptcy in his family. So, And still he became one of the most famous writers of all time, full of imagination. And so it's not nothing is set in stone, but we shouldn't underestimate all of these factors when it comes to creativity. We're talking about creativity like it's for or kind of to express ourselves that everyone like everyone can do that, but it's a lot of groups in our society that will naturally silence themselves. Or if you're gay or have a different uh, gender identity, you will always be you will have been subjected to so much violence and so much bullying that you will probably silence yourself long before you have even uh, been able to meet an outward crit- critic. Right, right. Well, that is not that is not the happiest thought. So I thought. <laughs> <laughs> should, we, uh, should we stop on the happiest? Let's stop moment? on a let's stop on a happier thought. And and the reason I wanted to talk to you and and have you on the podcast was I was thinking um, it'd be a great topic for the beginning of the new year. Um, so. What I wanted to end with was if you could just say what what would be like your your maybe three to five things that someone could do for twenty twenty four that would that would make them more creative for the new year because I think I think people would like to know that and I would like to know that as well and and yeah, I should say besides reading your book because. That has the keys, all the keys to creativity in it. But if you were to distill it down, what what would you say? Do you work for a science or technology focused organization and would like to create video content, but don't know where to start? Well, my company, Flowsberg Media, the publisher of this podcast, can help you. We are a one-stop shop that can provide content strategy, video production, and even social media management. Our previous clients include educational institutions, academic publishers, trade organizations, and aerospace companies. These are innovative, world-changing organizations who are leading humanity toward a brighter future. Learn more at flowspark.com or look for the link in the description below. First of all, and this is something I'm working on, and I will do this much more in 2024, turn off your phone and put it away. And how kind of specific hours when you answer your email or, you know, are active on uh, social media, but just as little as possible. So that is my goal for 2024, to be very much unlogged. 
Uh, also, <laughs> if you want to take care of your brain in the best possible manner, it's uh, very few things you can do that are uh, very efficient. Uh, sleep mm -hmm. properly, <laughs> like seven, eight hours every night if you're an adult. Uh, eat uh, half healthy, not too healthy. Don't do, don't overdo it, <laughs> <laughs> and move move for thirty minutes every day, and that is the general tip that every GP will tell you. Yeah. Just these things are good generally for your health and your brain is part of your body. So you do the same for the brain and you will be very fine. For me, it's also doing something half boring uh, that is um, in kind of in silence that gives me the time to think long thoughts, mm -hmm. which is uh, I go for a walk in the woods. That's part of my work, I think. So when I go for a uh, walk in the woods, it's part of my work as a writer. So I go there and I don't have a plan to solve any specific problems in my work, but I always solve something during that walk. Or I do yoga, or I swim, or I do ice bathing. These are things that will kind of make you happier, make you more able to solve problems and create problems that you can solve yourself. And also, <laughs> I say this to youth and they look at me like I'm crazy. I tell them, you can conquer the world if you can read a book. But if you read books, you can learn something, kind of you get into deep learning. Mm -hmm. To just flash something on your phone will not give you deep learning. Right? Uh, to read a book is to walk through a whole topic guided by a writer. And that is something that gives you kind of more insight into this world. So the more you read, the more material you will have to think around. And to, that will expand your world and it will make you conquer the world. <laughs> great. Those are great. Um, yeah. And actually, I have to tell you personally, reading your book, um, made me realize why I like doing this podcast because it forces me to read books that maybe I wouldn't have read, you know, I wouldn't have picked up, uh, immediately. Um, and then I get to interact with the authors of the books as well. And that's fuel for my creativity. So, yeah, you know, um, and I was just going to say that I don't, I think ice bathing sounds like a very Scandinavian, um, activity. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a lot of research on it. You will become happier. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> Great. Um, and also the kind of last thing, just don't yeah. be so productive. Just don't try so hard yes. to, to do something. Just uh, allow yourself to get lost and to play with things and to be open, as open as possible. Just taking in a lot of impulses. Yeah. I think, I think that's... An, and be with a friend, of course. Friends. Yeah. I think, Celebrate friendship. I think that's mm. a great, another great takeaway. It's just that we often think of our work as we have to be sitting at our computer type, doing something, but sometimes our work is away from our computer. Sometimes our work is daydreaming. And, and um, I mean, that's something I took away from your book as well, so... So anyways, Hilda, it's been awesome speaking with you. And um, I think it's just a great way to start the new year. And um, for people that want to follow your work, where can they find you online? Are you on any of the social media platforms or do you have a website? Trying or? not to be. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to be at all. But I got a Facebook profile and a closed Instagram profile. I would try not to be on TikTok <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, website? Do you have a website? Yeah, I have a website. It's called Forfatterhilda. <laughs> okay. <We're international. laughs> okay, we'll 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 put a link to that because I don't know if that people are going to be able to pick that pick that up. Um, no, they can't. <laughs> if they're not, <laughs> if they're not Norwegian. Um, <laughs> so okay great well it's been great talking to you and um i look forward to your your next book on loneliness yeah thank you All right. thank you so much it was so nice talking to you 
Well, that's it for this show. And as always, I hope you've learned as much as I did. If you enjoyed this episode, you should definitely check out our previous conversation with neuroscientist Henning Beck on how to use your brain. Until next time, I'm Eric Olson. <laughs>